Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. To uncover football tactics, we create spaces and times. We use time query, construct spaces, construct times. Our approach was used for reconstructing team tactics in different classes of game situations. Our domain experts are happy and the Germans shall win again and again. MetroSets is an online platform for visualizing sets as metro maps. In this style of drawing, sets are represented with metro lines, while the elements they contain are represented as stations. MetroSets is implemented using a modular four-step pipeline, with a variety of choices for each step. The final visualization is interactive, with support for all common set operations. MetroSets is fully implemented and can be found at the displayed URL. The recent technological advancements in mixed reality extend our ability to evaluate new visualizations faster than ever before. In a user study with 60 participants, we compared four situated visualizations using five different empirical methods. In contrast to prior work, our results showed no dependency between the user's feedback and the empirical methods. Atmospheric convection is one of the most important phenomena in metrology. This response.
Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the session for the Viz Short Papers. This is a session that's just going to encompass a, a bunch of very interesting short papers about systems, libraries, and algorithms. And um, I'm very excited to welcome you to watch these upcoming eight uh, presentations. We have all eight pres presenters, uh, plus one, <laughs> I should say, um, uh, here ready to answer your questions. Um, I'm going to, before each talk, uh, paste a little snippet uh, about people's presentations, um, their, their title, who's presenting, and a link to their paper site so that you can go and see their um, abstract, their keywords, and their PDF if you so desire. Um, after e each talk, we're going to have a Q&A session of about three minutes. Um, we're also, we have eight talks for a 90-minute period. So 
each talk was budgeted 10 minutes, we can go a little bit over if people are excited and asking questions. So um, with that, um, I, I guess I should also say that I, I am a, a research and development engineer at Power BI uh, working at Microsoft. And uh, I'm just very excited to help bring you all these presentations today. So with that, we can start with the first talk that's gonna be accelerating force-directed graph drawing with RT cores. Uh, presented by Stefan Zelman. Hi, everyone. Today I'm presenting our work on accelerated graph drawing using NVIDIA's RTX ray tracing hardware. Let me first give you a brief introduction into force directed graph drawing. Graph drawing in general is concerned with finding nice layouts for graphs given by their vertex set V and by their edge set E. Those layouts should adhere to certain aesthetic criteria, such as the number of edge crossings being minimal, or vertices from connected components being grouped together. In this talk, we will focus on a traditional force-directed algorithm, the frachtermann rheingold algorithm. This is a very simple algorithm that we're going to optimize using NVIDIA's RTX API. We have reasons to assume that more sophisticated algorithms will also benefit from our optimization. But we chose FR due to its simplicity. FR is an iterative algorithm that models spring forces between vertices that are connected by edges. At the same time, all vertices act a repulsive force on every other vertex. We iterate until the equilibrium is reached and the layout has converged to its final form. So the worst case, um, actually also the average case runtime of the attractive force phase is asymptotically bound by the number of edges, while the repulsive force phase is bound by the number of vertices squared. In the end, during each iteration, we apply the forces to the vertex positions, which can again be done in linear time. So um, given the graph here on the uh, left-hand side, we first compute the attractive forces for each pair of vertices connected by an edge. The repulsive forces, however, are computed via an all-pairs comparison, as each vertex might potentially affect every other vertex. Assuming that the number of edges is much smaller than the number of vertices, this is by far the most compute-intensive phase of the algorithm, with an average case runtime proportional to the number of vertices squared. Due to the physical laws that are associated with spring forces, only vertices within a certain radius will actually affect a given vertex V. We can use that to accelerate the repulsive force computation phase by building a spatial index like a quad tree or a KD tree over the graph's vertex set and later only consider those vertices within a neighborhood using a nearest neighbor query with a fixed search radius. As the vertices have no area associated with them, that radius is a global constant. We will use that property later when optimizing the search query using RTX. As the position change, uh, positions change after each iteration, consequently the end then also have to rebuild the spatial index. Let's now have a look at how this can be implemented using, uh, using a GPU, for example with NVIDIA's CUDA. We devote uh, separate GPU kernels to the respective phases. The attractive phase iterates in parallel over the edge set and updates the globally shared displacement vector using atomic operations. The repulsive phase is the most compute-intensive phase of the algorithm, and hence we are focusing on that. We process each vertex in parallel, then traverse the acceleration data structure, and during traversal, gather the nearest neighbors of V, and inside the traversal loop, update the displacement array. In the end, we update the vertex positions by just adding the vector displacement in a separate GPU kernel, and that's fast again as it's linear in the number of vertices and trivially parallelizable. We do this uh, forever or um, until the layout has converged and equilibrium is reached. So our idea was to map the repulsive phase um, to potentially hardware accelerated ray tracing with the NVIDIA RTX technology. Ray tracing is usually used to generate nice looking images like the ones shown here on this slide. We will show in the following how ray tracing can also be used to accelerate fixed radius nearest neighbor queries and hence the frachtermann rheingold algorithm. Ray tracing is based on intersecting light rays with a uh, surface description of a 3D scene. So as every ray needs to be tested against each and every surface, this is customarily accelerated using bounding volume hierarchies. The light rays are first intersected against a bunch of bounding boxes and only then against a subset of the, subset of the surfaces. 
Similar to the FR nearest neighbor query, the average case runtime can be reduced to be proportional to the height of the bounding volume hierarchy. NVIDIA's RTX cards can traverse DVHs in hardware and are compatible with arbitrary 3D user geometry. So in order to see how we can map uh, the nearest neighbor query to a ray tracing query, let's start out with the graph here on the left hand side. We are interested in the repulsive forces acted on the green vertex by its immediate neighbors. With a conventional nearest neighbor query, we'd expand a circle around the vertex and then traverse the KD tree or quad tree to first find all the tree nodes and consequently all the vertices that intersect the circle. Now with ray tracing, uh, we instead expand circles around all vertices. We then uh, let RTX build a BVH over the set of circles. So as RTX is a 3D API, we instead uh, of circles use uh, disks with infinitesimal thickness. Now in order to accumulate the forces acting upon V, we simply reverse that problem. Instead of gathering all the vertices contained inside the circle around V, we instead trace an epsilon ray. So um, that ray originates uh, at the vertex position and has infinitesimal length. In the callback program that implements the ray object intersection, we consider those disks that overlap the ray origin. Of course, we we'll reject the disk that is associated with V itself. And that way, we obtain the same set of vertices that we'd also have obtained using the neighbor's neighbor query. With RTX, we have a, a highly optimized uh, library available, which lifts the burden of having, having to code up an optimized spatial index, and we potentially can make use of hardware acceleration. We thoroughly evaluated our approach using a bunch of different datasets. We use different types of artificial and real-world datasets with thousands of nodes and edges. We tested on several different NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, we are interested in the average runtime per iteration. We compare with a naive CUDA parallel implementation that doesn't use an acceleration data structure at all, but we also compare it with a fairly optimized CUDA nearest neighbor query using the LBVH algorithm. That is obviously not as optimized as NVIDIA's RTX, nor is, is this our objective here. Uh, nevertheless, we observe a speed of, of, of 4 to 13x over LBVH. All in all, we think that our approach is, a, is, is clever, and, but of course it's not without limitations. Mapping nearest neighbor queries to RTX might be helpful in general. We have shown this for fixed radius queries, and obvious future work would comprise extension, uh, extensions to KNN queries, or to other applications like, for example, photo mapping. We believe that our approach is general enough to scale to more complicated graph drawing algorithms as well, but for further studies, um, but, uh, further studies are required to confirm that. So with that, I am closing the talk, and I'm happy to take your questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that talk, Stefan. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. No questions on Discord, but I prepared a couple. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm curious if you've considered like a falloff method to take uh, sparsity into account. So potentially varying the radii of points that you consider? Uh, we didn't actually do this. Like mm -hmm. um, what we wanted to do is like um, exactly re-implement this very simple algorithm mm -hmm. as like, a proof of concept to find right. out, uh, out um, does it work on this very simple algorithm? I mean, there are, there are certain optimizations you could definitely apply to this algorithm. Um, actually, um, uh, regarding the radius, um, 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 the usually, so like in physics, you often have um, inverse square laws. And uh, I mean, we actually don't have this there, but this is an, uh, a uh, one over k law, like, um, like there is not, not a square involved, which is quite interesting because the radiuses are quite bigger than with an inverse square law, actually. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but this is would be interesting, like trying varying radius. Yeah, for sure. And the, I, the fo I, my follow up question is kind of in the same node because I can imagine there, there could be like a set of important nodes or important structures, and for some reason those are more constrained than others. Or you know, say like I want I want to make sure that this pattern is kind of enforced. How, yeah. how might you do that with this? Yeah, this is a, actually a very very excellent question because um because um this makes the problem actually much harder. Yeah. Like um, what you're what you're referring to is like you have weighted nodes, right? Like have mm -hmm. a weight associated with the node, and so. So um, the node we had like an like a non-infinitesimal area. This is much harder to do. Like the trick that we're we're doing here is um, that um, each each uh, node uh, has like infinitesimal area, and then we can get like the mm -hmm. same radius uh, to each node. 
And the problem actually gets uh, much more complicated. And this is actually, we're, we're looking into this, uh, how to do this, but it actually gets much more complicated when you have varying radii. Yeah, I, I'm almost curious, like, I wonder if you use like some sort of like material, like almost like a, like a transfer function of light you know, you can kind of like define a BRDF or something on a surface. Maybe you can modulate it per point or something like that. Also that you don't have, even have the force contribution like like diffusely coming from all directions, but uh, mm -hmm. from, from different directions. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> if you have further questions, I, I guess I should also say that we should take advantage, if we have access to Discord, um, we should take advantage of these hallways. So if maybe even after the entire session, we could all meet in the hallway. That'd be pretty neat. Um, it, but if you have further questions, uh, please feel free to follow up with Stefan. And yeah, it's cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. And so for our next talk, um, we're going to be discussing uh, some work by Chanmut Kidavarong uh, and co-authors at the IDL. Um, their work is titled Fast and Flexible Overlap Detection for Chart Labeling with Occupancy Bitmaps. Take it away. Hi, my name is Chanmut. I'm presenting Fast and Flexible Overlap Detection for chart labeling with occupancy bitmap. The work is done in collaboration with Dominic Moritz, Ganit Mosupasawat, and Jeffrey here. First of all, we would like to look into the importance of annotating marks with labels. In this connected scatter plot, it shows the relationship between gas price and average miles driven per capita in each year. In this scenario, Adding labels gives information specific to each point, helping us to identify each year easily. So what is our goal? Placing a label to the upper right of each data point will cause collisions. Instead, we rearrange them to avoid each other and improve their readabilities. And what have we achieved with our algorithm? First, place label by our algorithm do not present any overlapping. Second, our algorithm is fast. And third, our algorithm can be used with different types of charts. However, we will not try to maximize the number of labels placed. We learned that maximizing it gives an exponential runtime and is contradict with our second goal. Greedy approach is used by particle-based labeling, which is one of the prior works that we found the most efficient. The approach is perfect for a fast labeling algorithm with a good number of placed labels. To see how the greedy approach works, let's zoom into a part of our connected scatter plot. A greedy labeling algorithm places labels without reconsidering their positions. For example, when it tries to place the label 1985, none of the around positions is available, it then omit the label 1985 instead of moving the label 1984 to fit the label 1985. Since we iterate through each label once, it is an ON for iteration. However, a placement of each label requires checking if the label overlap with anything. So the problem leads us to the main focus of this paper how to detect overlapping efficiently. The particle-based approach is efficient, but we find that further improvements can be made. In this paper, we introduce bitmap-based overlap detection using occupancy bitmap. To detect overlapping, it rasterizes existing marks and the placed labels into the bitmap. To check if a label can be placed inside the red rectangle area, it checks if there is any pixel under the area and is occupied. In this case, there is, so the label cannot be placed here. The runtime for rasterizing existing marks depends on the number of existing marks and chart resolution. And the runtime for placing labels depends on the number of labels and label size. Since the chart resolution and label size are usually not varied, the overall runtime on the number of existing marks and the number of labels is linear, 
Now, our secret sauce is the occupancy bitmap that we optimize to make the overlap detection even faster. To see how we optimize it, let's look at its structure. We create an occupancy bitmap with a wrapped array of n bit integer. One bit represent an occupancy for, of a pixel. In this slide, we use four bit integer for the purpose of demonstration, but in the actual implementation, we use 32 bit integer for our faster operations. Bitmap supports two main operations, which are lookup and update. To see how lookup works, we will use this example. Suppose there are two occupied pixels as shown. We want to know if we can place the label 1982 at this position. Then we need to check if every pixel in the orange rectangle is not occupied. It looks up one integer at a time. This means that it can look up four pixels at once here and 32 pixels at once in the actual implementation. In the case of this integer entry, the bitmap will mask out the part of the integer that is outside of the lookup area. Even though the integer entry is not zero, the non-zero part is masked out. Continuing in the next line, the algorithm finds an integer that contains occupied pixel. So the label cannot be placed at this position. To see how update works, we use this example Suppose we want to place the label 199 at this position. The algorithm marks pixels as occupied one integer at a time at the first and last row. Then every other key row where k is the height of the least tall label. It doesn't have to mark the pixels in every row because no any occupancy lookup we have its height more than k. For a benchmark, we compare the bitmap-based labeling algorithm to our implementation of the particle-based algorithm. Our algorithm is faster, more than 22%, and tends to be even faster as the shard size grows. In terms of the number of labels placed, we can place a comparable number of labels to the particle-based labeling of no more than 3% lower. The other selling quality of occupancy bitmap is its flexibility. It can be used to label different types of shards and remains fast regardless of mark size and shape. Here are the examples of labeling using our occupancy bitmap. Our occupancy bitmap can be used with points, lines, rectangles, or any arbitrary shapes. It even works with zooming and panning interactive shard with a moderate size dataset. Finally, for an application, this work is open source and is a part of Vega as an extension. To demonstrate how the label transform is integrated into Vega, suppose we have a chart with text labels. We can use the label transform to quickly rearrange the text to avoid collisions to both lines and other labels. As a result, the chart do not present any overlapping of any label, which improves their readability. And when the label transform is fully supported by Vega, we will populate the feature into Vega Lite as well. In Vega Lite, user will be able to label their shots with a more concise and in a higher level grammar. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk, Chungwood. Uh, let's see if they have any questions on Discord. Some claps coming in. Um, I got a couple of questions. Um, so I, I'm curious how you would mix this with the kind of a saliency based measurement. So being able to decide also um, what labels to show, because at least through the presentation, I, it looked like you were trying to show as many labels as possible, even though that wasn't your goal. At least the examples that you showed, all the labels that you could place, you were able to place. But how would you prioritize showing labels? Would it just the so, oh, sorry. Go so ahead. for for the function that um, we use to um, label, um, the the user or the client can um, sort the um, data by its priority before uh, inputting in the to the function because um, our function is just a greedy method, so it will um, place whatever comes first. So 
if you sort by your priority, it will test the first one first and then later one later. Fantastic. I know I, I've dealt with this problem before, it, specifically in Power BI, trying to label things. It's very hard for it to be good for all cases, yeah. but also at the same time, kind of deterministic. Like you don't, people don't want labels appearing and disappearing all over right. the place. We have a couple of questions in Discord. Um, Ayo Wu asks, uh, how might this technique adapt to rotated labels? Oh, so um, our um, algorithm only support um rectangle shape mm -hmm. label so um it would either be like the horizontal label or um vertical label sure okay um I, it looks like we have a question a question also from jason that's asking do we need to add something to reflect cyclical order sorry to reflect sequel it's cyclical order right in a cycle order in a cycle. I'm not quite sure actually what that means. <laughs> I'm not sure too. Um, can you clarify? Loops. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Perhaps okay. we could follow it up uh, later because okay, sure. it um, seems like we're two minutes over time. We but, can do um, offline chat. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. And I, again, uh, I said this after the first talk, but I would encourage both authors and people that are interested to congregate in the hallway after this, because I think um, talking face to face, or at least with audio, is a lot higher bandwidth than trying to type. <laughs> right. So thank you again, Chung, for your presentation, sure. for your, your co-authors for the paper. Thank you very much. And for our next talk, we have uh, Favre, Accelerating Direct Volume Rendering for Virtual Reality Systems. And this presentation will be done by Andre Vosh. Welcome to my talk about acceleration methods for DVR on head-mounted displays. Direct volume rendering has been a topic of interest in scientific visualization for a long time. It is often, but not only, used in the medical field to visualize CT and MRI scans of patients to gain more insight into the critical areas and stands between the gold standard of two-dimensional slice visualizations and the real world. To visualize these datasets, high-end desktop computers are used. The DVR algorithm in its core is computationally expensive, hence needing these advanced hardware. Over the last years, new devices have entered the market, so-called head-mounted displays, and due to its low price point, VR has entered the consumer mainstream. We consider that the usage of HMDs can heavily benefit the DVR context. HMDs provide explorative freedom and perspective perception not achievable on desktop displays. But how can we realize DVR on HMDs? Simply porting desktop application to the HMD, that does not work on multiple levels. Your typical desktop DVR application only covers a small portion of your screen, where we need to display full screen images for each eye on HMDs. Besides the typical resolution on desktop systems is far below the per eye resolution on VR headsets, which brings us to the next critical point of HMDs, the necessity of high update rates to avoid cyber sickness symptoms. We already mentioned that DVR runs on powerful desktop systems on a sub-HMD resolution. Even on those PCs and those lower resolutions, the update rate of HMDs is not maintained. Therefore, we worked on an acceleration method for DVR on HMDs that is not noticeable to the user while increasing the overall update rate. The key to our acceleration method is the human visual system. Our visual system is designed only to have a small portion of our overall visual field that we perceive as sharp and colorful. When we look at the lens curvature and pixel distribution of HMDs, we can see that only a small portion of the display center is kept in its original pixel density. Outer pixels are getting stretched further and further to cover the width of our visual field. We decided to use this biological property of our eye and massively reduce the resolution for outer focus areas for our acceleration method. To achieve this, we created multiple lookup textures fitting directly into our rendering pipeline. 
Since the lenses of HMDs are not movable and therefore have a fixed focus point, we can pre-compute these textures and do not need to adapt them during runtime. The effect that the lenses are set is also why eye tracking is not mandatory for our approach and differentiates our method to difficult foveation approaches. During runtime, we first compute the entry and exit position of the ray tracer using the original resolution of the HMD. Before the ray cast is executed, an intermediate step applies our resampling textures to these buffers and generates smaller frame buffers with fewer fragments. These new buffers include the central part in its original density and, depending on the reduction level, lower resolution circular patterns of the peripheral vision. Afterward, we execute our ray caster on these buffers using typical per fragment acceleration methods like empty space skipping and early rate termination to compute the per ray color value. In the last step, we reconstruct the final frame buffer in its original resolution for the HMD. In this step, the parts rendered in a lower resolution get upscaled and interpolated for the final image. After completing these steps for both eyes, we include the scene's additional geometry information and submit the final image to the HMD. Next, we take a quick look at the results of our implementation. At first, we will compare the performance in terms of refresh rate of our solution compared to a traditional full resolution renderer. We recorded a fixed set of interactions on the same dataset and used it as a benchmark for our system. Ray casting on the full resolution resulted in an average update rate of 61 Hz, far below our set goal of 90 Hz. Applying only one subsampling stage boosted our performance to 94 Hz, exceeding our set goal and average. While being on average above 90 Hz, we still dropped below 90 Hz occasionally, which could be avoided by simply applying a higher stage of our subsampling method. Another aspect we have to consider is the overall image quality. We compared a handful of output images of our benchmark to the full resolution counterpart and computed a PSNR value. While these values indicate that our results are lossy, what they are, it does not reflect the actual perception of the user. Due to only reducing the resolution in the peripheral field of view, users do not notice the introduced artifacts. During a small pre-study, we collected feedback from our participants. As you can see, they were impressed by the system's fluidity and none of our participants could notice a change in the overall image quality as we expected. In the future, we plan to develop our system further. We plan to include a dynamic system for the actual selection of the correct reduction level depending on the system's performance and revise our subsampling structures to fit even better to the human visual system. To evaluate our technique, we plan a full-scale user study to investigate our approach's drawbacks and limitations and quantify the effects. We aim to adapt state-of-the-art ray-guided direct volume rendering to visualize even bigger datasets. And recently introduced discrete VR headsets like the Oculus Quest with mobile SOCs also provide an opportunity for direct volume rendering, but these devices require even more acceleration methods to make the VR viable. So, I'm finished with my short presentation and thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you very much for that presentation, Andre. Hey, thank you. Um, let me check that for some reason. I didn't have Discord active. <laughs> uh, as questions roll in uh, from Discord, I had, I had an initial question. Um, I really like this technique because this just buys a bunch of computational time back for rendering for HMDs. Although it seemed to me that the technique was seeming to assume that viewers were always looking forward and perhaps turning their heads to view other phenomena instead yes. of say based assumption, yeah? So the, the concept of lenses found in HMDs are more or less fixed, yeah? So yeah. if you move your eyes inside a, a HMD, you can't shift your focus point inside mm -hmm. the lens. So more or less your focus point is always in the center. Got it. This is the, the base concept why we just have to render the center of the screen in full resolution and can more or less ditch everything on mm -hmm. the sides. Right. It was just, it, it was quite impressive to me that you were able to get interactive rates just by making, kind of coding this assumption into the software. Yeah. 
any questions from the chat? If that's the case, I, I do encourage people to follow up with Andre directly. I think that the uh, both, you know, the description of your uh, implementation is extremely helpful for people working in this space. So <laughs> thank you. I thank you. Thank you for presenting it. For our next talk, um, we will be talking about dimensionality reduction. Uh, Druid.js, a JavaScript library for dimensionality re reduction. And this uh, talk will be presented by Rene Chutfoy. Hey, hello, my name is Rene Chutora. I present Druid.js, a JavaScript library for using and interacting with dimensionality reduction. First, I will give an introduction, then I will show you a demo, and at last, I will show you some of our evaluation results. Visualizations on the web are very popular and common nowadays, and dimensionality reduction is an important tool for dealing with high-dimensional data. There are plenty of DR methods and there exist some libraries bundling some of them. There is, for instance, SkyKit Learn for Python, DimRed for R, and the R Toolbox for MATLAB. Some JavaScript libraries exist, which implements one or two DR methods. For instance, MachineLearn.js, which implements PCA, DisneyJS, UMAPJS, and MDSJS, which implements PCA and Landmark MDS. To use a DR method, you had to use either a server client architecture, use an already existing JavaScript implementation, or if no implementation of the specific DR method exists, implement the DR method by yourself. Users with sensitive data will have privacy concerns using a web tool relying on a server client architecture. Existing JavaScript libraries have different interfaces, which needs look up by the programmer for each DR method, and implementing a DR method in JavaScript is not an easy task and can be very time consuming. Our JavaScript library TrueHS implements in the meantime 11 DR methods, is dependency free, has a consistent interface, and is easy to use. For the demo, I prepared an observable notebook where I already imported the D3, TrueHS, and the Iris dataset, which consists of 150 objects of three different kinds of flowers and has four different dimensions per object. I prepared a draw function, which takes the projection, creates a SVG, and draws the projection into the SVG. To project a data set with uh, an DR method, you create an DR object, for instance, PCA. As argument, you give the data set, and then you transform it. I show you the result with the prepared draw function. And if you want to project the data with, for instance, MDS, you can change it here, uh, for instance, to MDS or Isomap or LSP or Disney. Disney is an iterative method where we implemented a generator function. Uh, the generator function returns an iterator which yields the intermediate results of the process, of the dimensionality reduction process. So let's create a generator. And iterate through. And draw the intermediate results. If you want to change the parameterization of the DR method, you can look up which parameters are available by looking into the variable parameter list. Disney has two parameters perplexity and epsilon which can be set after the in the constructor after the data set for instance i want to change perplexity to 10 and epsilon to 1 which results in this view 
in this projection. I also can use the parameter method, which takes as first argument the name of the parameter, a second argument the value, for instance I want to set it to 2, which leads to a bad projection. Uh, or I use the alias para and set the perplexity for instance to 100 which results in a better projection. Another dimensionality reduction method which is iterative is umap um, for the generator method is much more important for bigger data set size, uh, sizes. We have, for instance, the Fashion MNIST dataset, which consists of 766 objects of 10 different kinds of objects and has 784 different dimensions. And you can see here the generator method, which already shows some results. If I want to show the final result by using the transform function, it would need much longer. Mm -hmm. The generator method starts much earlier. So now to the evaluation. We, we evaluated it through HGS by comparing the runtimes of the Python implementations of Skykit-Learn and Umap-Learn and the existing JavaScript libraries. Each row represents a TR method, each column a dataset length, and each line in the boxes for a dimensionality of the dataset. For each line, we show the two fastest libraries of the five runs per library and stopped for higher dataset sizes if the run times exceeds 10 seconds. DreeJS comes out on the top for smaller dataset sizes, except for PCA, which is not that affected from high dataset sizes, but much more from high dimensionality. And for MDS, where DreeJS performed better than the SkyKit Learn implementation. More detailed figures can be found in the supplemental material as well as in the online demo. In the online demo, each DR model can be tested, uh, for each DR method exists a table like this one, uh, with rectangles defining a set of dataset size and dimensionality. By clicking on one of the rectangles, the site creates a random dataset of the respective set of dataset size and dimensionality, and computes a projection in your browser. The result gets projected on the right with, with, with the respective runtime it needed. In conclusion, DruidJS offers an alternative to other libraries, which should lower the barrier to use the R methods in a web tool. Thank you very much. Here are some additional resources. Thank you, Renee, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I like that you introduced the library and then showed you using the library. And uh, I think it got a lot of people in the Discord very excited. Um, let me start first with a question from uh, Danielle. Uh, she asks, does the toolkit explicitly support investigation or comparison across uh, dimensionality reduction methods? And you're muted, sorry. Um, so I built once an, another tool called Compatre, which allows to compare different, different methods uh, there are already used uh, through HS, but um, uh, what exactly with uh, e explicitly support investigation or comparison, I don't really know. I think it might be of the form, um, imagine somebody trying out a bunch of dimensionality reduction methods and being able mm -hmm. to say, explore kind of the different ramifications of using like say TSNE versus like PCA or something like that. Um, yeah, so for, for example, I did another uh, observable notebook. Can I share my screen? 
No. No, but okay. do you, sorry, do you have a link? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in this notebook, you can uh, pick an, and uh, you can pick a dimensionality reduction method and parameterize it. And down below, you can see the, the results. I have another one uh, with the iterative versions, with, with, which have um, the generators, where you can see the, the generators. Yeah. And I wanted to add, uh, I, I implemented also topo map, which is a technique which, which gets presented tomorrow. Um, there I have also an observable slide. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. And maybe I'll follow up with, there seems to be some kind of uh, implementation questions. Uh, Andrew asks uh, that dimensionality reduction methods can be pretty heavy weight. Does this library support a type of worker or multi-threading support? Um, no, uh, no workers, uh, but uh, the transform functions and the generators, they have also an async implementation, mm -hmm. so it can run co-occurring. Great. Okay. Um, so th there's a couple more questions on Discord, but in the interest of time, we're going to transition to the next presentation. Thank you very much again for your presentation. Thank you. Our next presentation will be given by Zachary Cutler. He'll be talking about Track, a library for provenance tracking and web-based visualizations. Hello, and welcome to the presentation for Track, a library for provenance tracking and web-based visualizations. I am Zach Cutler, and this paper is work I do of Kieran Godoff and Alexander Lex. So why should we care about provenance tracking? Although it is gaining popularity, provenance is still rare to find actually implemented in a finished tool. Implementing provenance can take a lot of time and effort, so why? The obvious answer is for undo redo, which has always been a desirable feature for a tool, empowering users and analysts to not fear making mistakes. Tracking provenance does indeed make implementing basic undo redo trivial and also makes full action recovery, including branch states that would not be recoverable with undo redo stacks, easy to access. But Undo Redo is just the tip of the iceberg of what can be achieved with provenance tracking. Reproducibility is a primary benefit, including recovering past sessions, as well as annotating or bookmarking nodes for later analysis. A visual history of our interactions becomes possible. The potential for collaboration, including asynchronous and synchronous collaboration, comes to exist. Logging of metadata can be useful for anyone trying to analyze their users, such as in a user study. Because of these benefits, web-based provenance tracking itself is not a novel idea. Some libraries allow for the implementation of undo redo, such as Redux or NGRX. Within the Viz community, there's recently been an increased focus on provenance, including a few tools that track provenance and examples of history visualizations. But most provenance tracking has still been ad hoc solutions created for specific tools. These solutions can be time consuming and naturally will likely lack some of the key benefits that provenance can provide. To remedy this, we created Track. Track is designed to be a lightweight, modular library that is easy to integrate. It includes simple ways to share state with others or to store entire sessions to a server. Track also has a sister library, TrackViz, which is an optional addition that ensures visualizing and navigating through the provenance graph is easy. Track uses an efficient yet powerful storage model that I want to take a little bit more time to talk about. But first, let's talk about the history of provenance storage models. Here and his colleagues discussed the two common models used to create provenance. The first model is state-based, a simple solution which stores the entire state of an application at every node. This solution is fast, but naturally it is also memory intensive to the point that it lacks real viability. The second solution, action-based, is more or less the inverse. State is never stored, only the function and the parameters required to go from one node to the next. This solves the storage size problem, but can be slow when jumping long distances in the graph since you iteratively need to touch every node in the sequence between your start and your destination. Additionally, and importantly, the stored data for action models is application dependent. Without knowledge of the application's functions, it is impossible to analyze. 
The hybrid solution occasionally stores states, sort of as checkpoints, and otherwise stores actions. This is a good compromise between speed and memory, but the output is still application dependent. A hybrid solution can also be more difficult to implement because to do so efficiently requires forward actions, backward actions, and sometimes rules for when to save the entire state. Instead, Track introduces a different model entirely, which we're calling the differential states model. Similar to the hybrid solution, we only occasionally store entire states. But between state nodes, instead of storing actions, we store diff nodes. For example, here, the first node stores the entire state. The next three nodes make small, individual changes to the state, and so only store the difference between their state and the previous state node. Eventually, enough of the state changes that it is worth storing the entire state again, and another state node is created. This model reduces the storage overhead of the state-based solution while ensuring constant time movement between nodes and easy to analyze exports. Notably, all this is abstracted away for the user unless they want to specify when a state node should be stored. As I mentioned earlier, Track has a sister library named TrackViz, which is used to visualize and navigate the graphs that Track creates. Here's a look at TrackViz from a tool created for a paper preprint. As you can see, icons for nodes are customizable, you can easily view branches, and you can also see annotations that have been added to certain nodes. Let's look at a simpler example. This one from a set of examples that we created to show users our recommended ways to use the library. In this basic ANSCEMS Quartet visualization, you can see that the system has grouped a series of nodes. Grouped nodes can be collapsed and opened on demand. This feature is intended to both help with scaling problems and to provide more unique functionality when desired. In this case, the group nodes are a series of what we call ephemeral nodes. Nodes which the developer labels as ephemeral are ignored on the typical undo-redo chain ensuring that developers can track actions like hovering a node or even basic mouse movements without under redo doing unexpected things for the front end user. And of course, clicking on any node in the graph jumps to that node, updating the visualization. All right, now that we have an idea of how track works, I wanna return back to the primary motivations that we had when creating this library and talk about the specific features created to address them. First, persistence and sharing. Importing and exporting graphs is simple, requires no extra work, and is entirely JSON-based, allowing you to create your own databases that stores provenance graphs and load them at any time. If you'd also like that part covered for you, there is built-in Google Firebase integration for easy storage to your project's Firebase. Finally, for quicker sharing, individual states of an application may be shared at any time through the URL. Track stores an encoded version of the current state in the URL and anyone loading the same URL will load the stored state. This is for when you want to instantly show somebody else what you are looking at. All right, now on to analysis. This is the cool stuff for research purposes and where the design choices that we discussed earlier really bear fruit. We believe Track is a great tool for log file analysis as well as empirical or longitudinal studies. Track has been used for analysis purposes in two papers, one which presented at CHI 2019 and one preprint. In both cases, track was used to conduct and record user studies. What you see here are timeline views from those user studies. This is made possible by track's ability to store custom metadata at each node, as well as by our differential states model, ensuring that the exported data is application independent. On the bigger picture, Revisit is a project that some friends of ours are working on, which is a tool entirely for analyzing user studies which use provenance. We are extremely excited about the potential to use Track with user studies and user analysis in general. Track is a library that we are still actively working on and hope to grow in a few areas in the near future. We want to allow for both asynchronous and synchronous collaboration. We also hope to keep improving our differential state strategy to take up as little memory as possible, as well as continue to create better integration with analysis tools so the developer has to do as little data wrangling as possible. Thank you all for coming. Track and TrackViz are currently published in NPM, and we hope to see many of you trying Track in the near future. Thank you very much for your presentation, Zach. Uh, we have a couple questions in Discord. Um, James Egan is asking, uh, how hard would it be to adapt such state tracking and sharing to synchronization? He gives the examples of WebStraits or VizConnect. Yeah, so um, synchronization is actually something that is pretty much just 
the next thing that we plan on working on. Um, we, well, we don't think it'll be super easy, but it's definitely something that um, we're currently planning on doing and we're really excited, especially about synchronous collaboration. Um, yeah, I think that'd be really cool. Cool. Uh, Dr. TJ Junkun Kelly is asking some questions about uh, the specifics of the implementation, asking about the cycles and the exploration. So for example, if there's a, basically you return to the same result somehow, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so um, some, some libraries that deal with provenance um, actually do things like merging nodes when they have the exact same state um, and coming up with a way to just merge them together. Uh, we are not currently doing that. So currently, if you have two nodes that end up at the exact same state, um, those will both be represented in the graph. Yeah. Cool. He also asks that this is similar to viz trails. I don't actually know the specifics of viz trails, but could you comment on that? Um, yeah, so viz trails is actually um, one of the other authors on this paper. Alex uh, worked on viz trails. Sure. I'm not super familiar with it, so I can't. I think he actually okay. um, replied in the Discord, but yeah. Ah, there's some philosophical questions being raised there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's. That's a bit over my head. <laughs> yeah. So it seems to be like more and more about tracking actions rather than workflows. And that's actually part of the question I had prepared, which is, uh, could you kind of tell that somebody is kind of fundamentally changing their visualization task, like through through this provenance? Hmm. I mean, I quite understand what you mean. But... So like, so say if, a, if one task was to try to understand what the, what's the shape of the data look like? And then all of a sudden they're taking a bunch of tasks and they're starting to like actually drill down to like an individual data point. Mm -hmm. How would you imagine you could use track to kind of support maybe the visualization now adapting it's how it changes by virtue of the sequence of actions that it took to get to that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a really interesting question. So one of the things that we've done in projects that uh, implement track is allow for people to, for example, import like entire sessions. Um, so I think that's a feature that would be really cool for this, right? If that you can literally watch like an analyst or a user, um, as they do that drilling down, you can watch step by step, you know, what they do, what they're clicking and how they got there. Um, yeah, what I think is a really cool feature. Cool. Fantastic. Um, there's a couple more questions in discord, but in the interest of time, we're going to move to the next presentation. Thank you again for your presentation. I encourage people to follow up. Uh, with the authors afterward, uh, I said this after the first two presentations, but I'll say it again. Uh, head to the hallway after the session, <laughs> catch the authors. I think it, it, it's a higher bandwidth way to, of talking with people as opposed to using Discord. It, these channels seem to more or less die after the session. So uh, let's keep the discussion going. Cool, thank you. So our next presentation is just typical, visualizing common function type signatures in R. And this will be a dual presentation by Cameron Moy and Julia Balakova. Hi, I'm Cameron. Today, Julia and I will be presenting Typical, a visualization of common function signatures for the R programming language. This research was done with the help of several other collaborators listed here, all at Northeastern University. Before we start, I want to give a brief overview of some of the contributions of our work. First, a task abstraction for programming language designers, especially type system developers. The design and implementation of Typical, an interactive visualization of runtime type signatures that you can see on the left. And also, an initial validation of this system. We'll be focusing on the second point in this talk. So, What's the motivation for visualizing runtime type signatures? Well, suppose you're a programming language designer working on R, a programming language that's often used for statistics and data analysis. And you've been hearing a lot about gradual type systems, like TypeScript. A gradual type system takes an existing dynamically typed programming language, in this case JavaScript, and adds static types. In this example, we have a simple addition function. The TypeScript version at the top has type annotations on the parameters of the function, indicating that the arguments will be numbers. These type annotations are checked at compile time. This is in contrast to the JavaScript version at the bottom, which has no type annotations and is not statically type checked. With gradual typing, a programmer can have a system with both typed 
and untyped components, and the whole thing will still work. This is great for developers who want to reap some of the benefits of static types without having to commit to migrating an existing code base to a brand new language. So if you want something like this for R, how do you go about designing its type system? A type system requires you to make lots of choices. Do you want subtyping? What about polymorphism? How do you handle objects and mutation? Typically, you would use your personal experience writing code. Lots and lots and lots of code. And you'd come up with something that's reasonable. But this is pretty ad hoc, and it's a potentially biased approach. How one person writes code is unlikely to be representative of all developers who use the language. A more principled approach would be data-driven. You could have a hypothesis, collect relevant data from a large body of real-world programs, and then confirm or refute your hypothesis based on this evidence. But there's a big problem with this approach, and that's code is rich in structure and in meaning, and it's difficult to analyze and interpret broad trends across a whole programming language ecosystem. Take runtime type signatures as an example. If we want to gather a suitable data set, you can perform the following procedure. Take a bunch of programs, run each of them, record the input and output types of every function call. Running one small program may result in a table of signatures that can be analyzed by hand, like we have here. But what if we run many, many programs? The table of signatures could end with millions of entries. How do you make sense of it all? That's where typical comes in. Let's see how it works. With Typical, a programming language designer can visually explore the multitude of function type signatures in the raw dataset. This is Typical's main view. The core component of the visualization, a parallel sets diagram, represents every function type signature as a type flow. We'll get back to this panel shortly. To the right of type flows, there is a filtering panel. It allows the user to explore and filter the data set, focusing on subsets of interest. For example, to find information about a specific function, just type its name into the search box. Alternatively, we can use these tree maps to get information about specific packages or functions within those packages. Next, let's look at type flows. Every flow corresponds to a single function type signature and multiple signatures of the same function are bundled together. In this example, we are looking at ABS function, which returns the absolute value of a number. The name of the function is displayed at the top of the diagram. Every type signature flows top to bottom. Horizontal lines indicate argument types, with the bottom one being the return type. Thus, the highlighted flow corresponds to a function from integer to integer. The 61k annotation means that ABS has been called 61,000 times. Width of flows is proportional to their frequency in the dataset. Finally, let's discuss some examples of how programming language designers can use Typical to develop a type system. They can ask the following question. Is ABS function polymorphic? Meaning, does it work with arguments of different types? The answer is yes, most definitely, because we can clearly see multiple flows going from the same function name. Compare this to the monomorphic case, where there is just a single flow for a function. Next, knowing that ABS is polymorphic, a researcher can make a hypothesis that its return type will always coincide with the argument type. However, this isn't the case. We can see from the picture that there are two different flows ending in the return type of double. Thus, at least one of them has to have a different argument type. So, to recap, Typical is an interactive visualization tool for programming language designers. It allows them to explore and analyze function type signatures and helps create a type system. Typical represents type signatures as flows, which enables their quick comparison and analysis. More details about the design and implementation of Typical, as well as a usability study for the R language, can be found in the paper. Our source code and preprint are available on OSF, and live visualization can be accessed online. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, both Cameron and Julia. Uh, 
as uh, some questions start to roll in in Discord, I got a couple of questions myself. Um, the first question is, uh, this seems like a very useful visualization. And I'm curious if you've thought about other static analysis topics. I, I know this isn't quite static analysis, but it's kind of the, you know, looking at the usage of a language that such a visualization can cover. Yeah, so the particular analysis we used here was a dynamic analysis. So we collected mm -hmm. a whole bunch of data at runtime. Um, but you could definitely imagine doing some static analysis on programs in order to get uh, similar-ish data um, mm -hmm. or potentially uh, different kinds of data. Um, but static analyses are, in general, um, require a lot of engineering to do, uh, right. maybe a little bit more so than dynamic analyses. So uh, mm -hmm. that's probably one reason why maybe a dynamic analysis would, would be more appropriate. Sure. I had another follow-up question that was you're, you're kind of getting toward the like oh what would be the kind of the ramp or how should we design a type system to make this kind of more properly type i said i don't know proper is the right word but properly type r what can you say about say um language designers made a decision how could they see the the ramifications of their decision using such a framework yeah, so uh, one thing you can imagine is, you know, you're in the design process and you maybe have a couple of different options um, and, and you want to choose between them. Well, maybe you could get, you know, two groups of people and, and uh, have them uh, in two different prototypes and then collect this visualization information and, and take a look at it, and maybe mm -hmm. make some measurements. Because I think sure. once, you, once you kind of ship out one of your language designs, you know, that's going to be it for, you know, potentially 20 years or something like that. And yeah. I think one of the, the big motivations here is we want to get those decisions right. Uh, and to do that, we need, we need data. So. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up TypeScript as, a, as an example, because I, I, I don't know, in my lifetime, and I guess I'm not too old, maybe not too young, but, but like TypeScript is the one language I can think of where like I see almost monthly, they keep changing the type system. And this is the first time in my life the more I'm like, I don't, I can sort of understand where they're going with this. And sometimes they roll back things and it's hard to tell like why they're making these decisions. And I think such a visualization as uh, you both presented on today um, is a fantastic step in trying to like increase the transparency of that. So uh, let's yeah, see if that's there's any- where we'd like to go, yeah. Cool, perfect. Um, I don't think I see any questions, but please feel free to follow up the presenters and the co-authors um, after the session. And I thank you both for uh, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So for our next presentation, uh, uh, the paper is called Lock, or Lock Prospector, uh, Metadata Visualizations for Lakes of Open Data. And this will be presented by Niha Makija. Hi everyone, this is Lock Prospector, Metadata Visualization for Lakes of Open Data. My name is Neha Makija. This is joint work with Mansi Jain, Nicolas Giavelis, Laura De Rocco, Sara De Bartolomeo, and Cody Dunn, all from Northeastern University. Data lakes are a recent trend that promote data availability over integration. Essentially, millions of tables are dumped together without much regard to integrating these tables and giving them a consistent schema. We work with open data since it's free to use without any restriction, but the technique can be carried over to a proprietary data lake as well. The two main characteristics of open data lakes are the huge, they can have millions of tables, and they don't have a clear structure, data within it can follow a mix of conventions. The recent high availability of open data lakes from governmental sources such as data.gov or non-governmental sources is very exciting for transparent re data science research worldwide. Some active research areas involve data discovery, data integration, and creation of benchmark databases. Very often, researchers don't care about the actual data present in the data lake, that is, the semantics, but rather structural properties. By structural properties, we mean parameters such as the number of rows, the number of columns, or the percentage of null or unique values in the data set. For example, imagine I'm a researcher testing my algorithm on real-world data. I would like my algorithm to work even if the data has a significant percentage of null values, and I also know that my algorithm needs a large number of columns to run. 
I would like to search for real-world data sets that match these structural specifications. I don't really care if the data set is about financial or agricultural data. However, open data portals tend to prioritize semantic-based search and offer limited functionality for structural metadata-based search. So we designed Log Prospector, a system to fish out appropriate data sets from data lakes based on the structural properties of data. Let us first quickly look at how researchers find appropriate data sets without the use of Log Prospector. To download data sets that match a certain specific set of requirements, a researcher must first individually download some data sets. Filter them out and see if they meet the requirements, and if they don't, then download some more data sets and repeat the process. Another common task is to uh, view aggregate statistics over um, data sets. To do this, the researcher must download all the data sets that they care about and run a custom script over them. This workflow is very time consuming and manual and not very adaptable to changing of vague requirements. Thus, we identified the need for visualization. To design the system, we followed a design study like methodology in a classroom setting. In accordance with this, we worked with a service learning partner, Dr. Laura Lirocco, a postdoctoral researcher at the Data Lab at Northeastern University. She works on problems such as data integration. We first interviewed her to understand the problem domain, her current process, and what her requirements were from a visualization. There were few key challenges in designing a visualization. The first was that the user could care about potentially many different attributes, not just the number of rows, the number of columns, but also the number of categorical columns or the number of null values in numerical columns specifically. The other problem is that data lakes are huge, so we needed a visualization that would scale across many data sets. And finally, different researchers could have different requirements, and not just that, requirements could vary by project for the same researcher as well. Keeping all these considerations in mind, we built Log Prospector. It uses multidimensional scaling, a technique that helps us represent high dimensional data in 2D. MDS preserves pairwise distances and guarantees that points that are more similar to each other are plotted closer together. We allow users to customize what similarity means to them by allowing them to assign weights to different metadata properties. Changing these weights triggers replotting of the MDS plot according to the new similarity function. Users can also choose if they care about numerical columns or categorical columns, or maybe both. Further filtering is supported with double-ended sliders. This is useful if the user has hard requirements. For example, the number of rows must strictly be under 1,000. It is also useful for excluding outliers from the MDS visualization. On the right-hand side, histograms provide summaries of aggregate statistics, provide overview of data distribution. There are four histograms for the four main attributes. Selecting a subset on the plot reflects on the histograms and now we can see the data distribution of the selected subset. Similarly, hovering on the histogram highlights the corresponding visual elements in the plot. For each of these data sets, details are provided on demand by hovering on them. Once you have decided which data set is appropriate, you can click on it and be directed to a download link. Before introducing Log Prospector to our service learning partner, we undertook a series of informal feedback. The feedback reassured us that the layout was clear and the interactions were logical and intuitive. We then re-interviewed our service learning partner. They used the visualization to find data with the specific set of properties that were relevant for an algorithm that they were designing. They found our interface to be quite useful and said that without the tool, they would use a custom code to accomplish the same task and profile and subset the data. This would have required more time and a much higher barrier to entry as there's no simple visual interface. With our tool, they just took 10 minutes to accomplish the task and they could see patterns in the data that were not visible before. Log Prospector can be extended in several key ways. Currently, we use a classic MDS implementation and this has cubic complexity. Because of this, the response time increases dramatically and the visualization does not update at interactive speeds for more than 200 data sets. This can be fixed by using an approximate MDS algorithm, since the exact results of the MDS computation are not relevant for our task. Another useful extension is the introduction of a new compare task. We can add the task of comparing two data sets in the data lake based on their structural metadata. An extension that would be useful for researchers who care about both semantic and structural metadata would be to combine log perspective with existing systems in data portals that have um, semantic data filtering, such as keyword search. 
so this was log prospecto thank you so much for listening um the visualization is available for you to play around with at logprospecto.github.io our paper as well as supplemental materials like the code and the data we used in the visualization are all available at this osf link we will be happy to take any questions thank you Thank you very much, Neha, for your presentation. Um, we have one question, or one question from Discord so far. Um, Andrew asks uh, that a big problem with data lakes is that they can become data swamps very quickly if file naming or typing is poor. So how, how do you think that your approach can aid in the exploration of these messy collections? Right, so we um, basically, that's an exact problem we want to solve. So we don't look at the semantics, that is the name. So even if the naming convention is not appropriate, we're just looking at the internal data distribution. So if you want some, if you want to find something that matches your required statistics, you can do that without going into the data tags with the new metadata. Great, makes sense. So I'm, I'm uh, one of the questions I had was like, how might this uh, visualization tool help the help me in the process of finding suitable data sets for joining? Because I know at least in my work, I'm in business intelligence. And so when people go to data lakes, they're kind of on the hunt for what can I join with? <laughs> like, yeah. like, like they have their own data and it's proprietary, but then they're like, oh, I can enrich this with, I don't know, traffic data or weather data right. or something like that. Right, um, so maybe this can't directly help you, but um, so the service learning partner we interviewed, she actually works on a similar problem. And uh, this will kind of help in the testing phase. So if you have an algorithm that finds appropriate um, data sets to join, you want to test it and you want to see if it works for different kinds of distributions, then this tool is something you would use. Like, does my algorithm still work for like when your data distribution has a lot of noise? So it'll help develop. Very cool. And I have like maybe a small follow up question. Uh, <laughs> what do you think there are other kinds of data that could be dimensionally reduced that would also be useful for data analysts? Um, I don't know of any offhand, but yeah. yeah, sure. If anywhere that you care about some structural properties, but not the actual, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the metadata tags that are available to so any kind of search, if you have the same kind of structure, then sure, you could use this. Okay, fantastic. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. I again encourage you uh, if you're interested to follow up with the authors and I thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. So for the last presentation in this session, I hope you are uh, been all engaged to watch all eight presentations. We're gonna move on to the last presentation of the session. Uh, the, the paper title is Encodable Configurable Grammar for Visualization Components. And this was done by Chris Wong Tufasawat. And I should mention that this paper has earned an honorable mention award from the short paper chairs. So without further ado, take it away. Hi, I'm Chris from the data experience team at Airbnb. Today, I'm gonna tell you about Encodable. Let's first talk about the motivation of this project. In practice, there are many ways to write code to create visualizations. Many abstractions are offered as visualization libraries, which can be roughly grouped into five levels of abstraction. At the bottom are the graphic libraries. At the top are the most ready to use straight out of the box chart templates, which is a collection of components by chart types. For example, Google Charts or Nevo. Both provide rich collections of components. Some libraries may contain only one component. The problem is all these components have different APIs. Component users just keep learning new ways to do the same thing. For example, setting x dimension of a scatter plot, some libraries require field x in the data. Some libraries are more flexible. Some accept field name as string, some accept accessor functions, and so on. With all these variations, switching from one library to another is exhausting. And the features are also inconsistent. Not all scatterplot components support log scale, for instance. For the sake of the component users, could a component be more similar? For component authors, that is not an easy request. There's no standard way to define API or any helper. Could building consistent components be easier? So it was on a quest to answer these questions. 
and was inspired by another group of libraries. The visualization grammars, such as Figalite, are based on the philosophy that one language can describe all charts. Here's a code to create a bar chart in Vigalite. This bar chart is described with two encoding channels, X and Y. Each channel has a name and its definition. The channel definition is flexible and includes many options. For example, you only need to add this line to use a log scale. Which made me wonder, could any visualization components define encoding like this? And that evolved into the solution. In Vegalite, there are two parts. First, the grammar, uh, which we want to adopt. And second, the passing and rendering logic, which we want the authors to handle rendering themselves. First, I adapted grammar, which was designed to describe a large number of visualizations into a grammar that can be configured for a specific visualization. Encodable assumes data is in tabular format. The first principle is that all visualization components have encoding channels. So we could define grammar as key value pairs of channel names and channel definitions. The channel definition can be one of these types. Value definition constants, for example, setting color channel to always be red. Field definition, when channel output should come from a field in each data point. For instance, text channel used the animal field in the data. Scale field definition, which takes value from a field in the data and applies scale to it. For example, set color based on field count using linear color scale from white to blue. Lastly, position field definition, which is the previous one plus axis. For example, Y channel is based on the field count, start the scale at zero, and place axis on the left. There's one problem with this naive key value pairs. If channel name is defined as any string, how could component users know valid channel names? Also, not all types of definitions are appropriate for every channel. This was addressed by requiring authors to define specific channels, list the channel names as key, with values being channel type and output type. This configuration will be automatically converted by encodable into proper channel name and definition types. In addition to the configurable grammar, encodable comes with a parser. To create a component, the component authors define a small configuration which combine with encodable into the component API. Then use encodable to pass user specification into utilities function that can be used in the rendering logic. Let's take a closer look at how this works in more details. To create a word cloud component, the author defined a config. This config is used to generate encoding grammar and declare as part of the API. Users see the API and write code according to it. The arguments are passed to the rendering logic. Encodable help creates an encoder from the incoming encoding specification and the config. In the create encoder function, the parser applies smart defaults and pass each channel separately and combine them into a single encoder and return. The rendering logic then can use this encoder to encode data point into the channel output and combine with other input from the users. In this example, the span HTML tag set color, font size, and text content based on data. The component author doesn't need to know whether the color is a constant used which view in the data or what kind of scale. These are all encapsulated by the encoder, which is very convenient. Adding a new channel, such as font family, now only requires a few lines of code, one in the config and another in the rendering logic. Let's see some example components. Encodable is framework agnostic. Some of these examples use D3, some use React, and you can use it with or without framework. This word cloud is similar to the code that we just walked through a moment ago. It's more extension to add emoji channel. This is a traditional scatter plot with X, Y, stroke, and fill channels. This is a more custom visualization component, but the channels still look familiar, X, Y, size, color, and text. This one uses coffee cups to display productivity within a week. 
not test the unorthodox encoding channels, drink level, drink color, and use to go cup. You can customize this channel the same way you expect to customize a scatter plot. If you want, you can encode the drink level with log scale. Beyond these examples, Encodable has been used to build components for the open source Apache superset. It is also publicly available as an NPM package. To recap, this work envisions a world where visualization components are more similar and consistent. The paper introduced a configurable grammar and a parser called Encodable to make a progress toward that world. Another benefit is the ease of adding or removing encoding channels make it easier to iterate and enhance a component. In the future, many more useful functionalities can still be added, as well as potential to extend this work to other platforms and languages. There are more details in the paper, and the code and more examples are available on GitHub. This work could not be complete without the help from these people. With that, I would like to stop here and take any questions you might have. Thank you for the presentation, Chris. Uh, you're generating a bunch of excitement on Discord. And while I <laughs> hopefully that leads to some very interesting questions, I'll, I'll lead it off with some questions of my own. Sure. Uh, just first off, it seems like um, you're kind of taking uh, computer science design pattern to the extreme, which is the adapter. So <laughs> can this, so can you provide an example of like what the, I mean, I guess I was going to ask about the genesis of it, but you, you talked about it during your presentation, but I, I'm thinking of like an example of like working on top of WebGL or something where it's just very complicated to use. Um, how do you see um, Encodable kind of working on top of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of see Encodable as the very like top level interface between the component builder and the users um, to provide like similar APIs. Like if you know how to define an x-axis and y-axis in Vegalite, you should be able to define your x-axis or y-axis in any other component. And then Encodable, I like, just uh, help the developer with uh, translating those specification into something they can use and then let them do like uh, the best of their abilities to like uh, implement their own way if they want to use webgl if they want to use react if they want to use jquery like uh, they can just take it from there um, sure cool and you you could kind of took one of my questions was just like how do you get the type safety but it looks like you're taking advantage of typescript <laughs> yes. Yeah, I learned from Bakerlite. <laughs> cool. <laughs> There's some long Twitter threads that I'm not going to be able to digest and generate a question from. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's see. I, I guess I could ask my second question, which is like, what's an example of saying swapping between libraries? Could you envision Encodable kind of acting as a bridge between two libraries? So for example, we had a presentation earlier that had like some dimensionality reduction. Um, tasks and so you wanted to kind of bridge that with i don't know some d3 built on mm -hmm. library like in my phd i worked on something called 2dim which is basically like make scatter plots for 2d right i think uh one thing that is maybe possible for this community is like a lot of grad students like build new type of visualization right sometimes it may be like some scatter plot with like variations of new features of things and then one thing people struggle when they implement their own custom component is how to define like apis like everybody come up with their own thing but at least with encodable there's something you can be leverage and cling on to like you can define that uh, component based on encodable so any new visualization that you implement at least has like similarity instead of everyone decide like okay here's how i'm going to define my like a uh, way to specify scales or x dimensions and if you look at 10 research tools or like even like open source libraries like there are 10 ways to do the same thing at least it may, it may reduce that um ideally to one i think it's that's gonna be hard but maybe it's gonna be less than 10. <laughs> that's my <laughs> yeah. goal yes that sounds great so it seems like uh, jason has distilled down his question to uh, tell us more about map tile examples so talking about the uh, flexibility and expressiveness that could be done with encodable mm -hmm. uh i think yeah the encodable map tile uh let's see um so 
that one um, when implementing this component, right? Uh, one just need to like uh, lay out the uh, like map uh, the rectangle in the position because that's on this like a, a fixed thing based on the map. And then after you implement that core, you have a lot of flexibility to think about what kind of encoding you would offer with this. Like you can add the few channel like with encodable that is like kind of two lines of code to add that. You can add a stroke, you can customize the font size, font family, um, font weight, and you know, the key list just keep going on. You can add text and other things. Um, and in the past, let's say if you want to add one additional uh, encoding channel, you have to start thinking, oh, how will my user be able to specify those things? Um, but like, and then, oh, do I support only linear scale, log scale, et cetera? Um, but with encodable, that is like encapsulate. So you do just like two lines just to add additional channels. Yeah, the, the thing that it makes me think about is like, you imagine like the library is like creating a glyph or something. And that glyph, you can imagine if you packed it with like 10 different you know, data driven <laughs> like <laughs> encodings, then it would be like this would like the, the, the interface to kind of augment that would be greatly simplified by using kind of this adapter pattern. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, there's a couple more questions in Discord. Uh, should I, I mean, I guess we have three minutes technically. I'll give you one more. <laughs> okay, sure, why not? Uh, let's see, Fritz asks, uh, how would the user know what feature or channel is supported by a component and what is not? So is there some sort of like documentation that, for example, that Encodable could provide to the user? And I'm assuming that's the user of the library, not necessarily like um, the library. So at the moment, like, uh, because every component will have a configuration, that configuration is like the gist of like, oh, what are the available list of channel names and definition? Mm -hmm. That's just as a start. But because it's like follow the same like structure, one could auto generate documentation based on that configuration. That is like something that I'm thinking is possible for future work, like because uh, it's standard, right? If you use a value definition, there is like a clear API for that, and we can generate documentation for like every component based on that. Sounds fantastic. Okay, thank you for answering all the questions and uh, congrats again on the award. And for all the presenters in this session, thank you so much for your presentations. I really enjoyed them watching the, these presentations multiple times. As I said at the top, I was very spoiled to have be able to see the presentations before <laughs> I was uh, chairing the session. And I should say that this session is, you know, systems, libraries, and I forget the, what the last thing is algorithms and so everybody here in this session has presented a library a system or an algorithm and if you at all find it useful i i implore you not to hesitate to reach out to these authors many of these papers do uh expose open source libraries that you can immediately build off of um and there's some discussion in discord but i i also said this multiple times throughout the session um if the authors would like i would encourage you to hop on over to the hallways that are at the top of the discord uh, channel session and maybe we could talk um face to face that might be a <laughs> higher bandwidth so uh thank you again for joining us for these eight talks and with that i'd like to close the session and thank everyone for their attention and the presenters for their presentations We present three external labeling concepts that allow a user to browse through point sets without the need of zooming in and out. In the first method, labels are distributed on multiple pages. The next method arranges the labels in a single row that can be continuously slid along the bottom side of the map. In our third method, labels are distributed on stacks which a user can independently browse through. In our work, we look at how narratives and gamification can be used to foster development of visualization literacy skills in young children between 11 to 13. We present our own instance of such a game, evaluate it in a between-subject study, and report results. We also detail key design considerations for future visualization-based games and highlight many opportunities for future work.
Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. We propose V2V, a comprehensive pipeline for variable selection and translation for multivariate time varying data. Our approach contains feature learning, translation graph construction, and variable selection. To demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach, we compare histogram matching, pixel to pixel, and cycle GAN to evaluate variable translation. In addition, we also compare an information aware framework to evaluate variable selection. Hi, my name is Sara. In my talk, I'm going to be presenting a visualization to display an overview of multiple sequences of events and attributes. The key feature of our visualization is how easy it makes spotting trends and patterns in the data. You can find more info in the links on the right. Thank you. How to know if a graph is correctly drawn? Are all the aesthetic properties preserved? To answer these questions, we currently use quantitative methods that require graph structure and are computationally expensive. We propose a new method that to directly compute these metrics from graph layout images using convolutional neural networks. Below are the results. To know more about our approach, please attend our talk. What is insight? It is a question that has bothered visualization researchers for a long time. We're wondering whether visualization practitioners think about data insights in the same way as visualization researchers do. So we interviewed 23 visualization practitioners to understand how they think. To find out more about what we found and the implications to the visualization community, take a look at our paper. The Make of Continuous Color Maps. We present the CCC tool, a new web tool for the creation, editing, and analyzing of application specific color maps. For the precise definition of color maps, we developed a new color map specification. This new structure increases the editability by reducing the numbers of colors to a minimum. MeetQs is an interactive visual platform which augments existing tools for meetings with features that help people engage and reflect. Its visualization shows if more people are satisfied or uncertain about the contents of a meeting. Attendees can add comments and upvote others' comments. Attendees can reflect on the contents and what happened during the meeting using the summary page sent after it is over. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Political debates are a rare opportunity for voters to learn valuable information about candidates and their stances on important issues, but they can also be inaccessible for casual, non-expert users. 
Through a two-year design study in collaboration with political scientists and journalists, we created a novel task analysis for exploring transcripts as a casual user and developed DebateBiz, an interactive tool for visualizing political debates for casual, non-expert users. We study viscous and gravitational finger-like features in a carbon dioxide storage simulation applied for global warming mitigation in Earth science. To support spatial exploration, we extract rich vessels to guide the finger detection. For temporal exploration, we visualize fingers using glyphs and create a tracking graph to identify temporal events. A short overview of the presentation for a simple pipeline for coherent grid maps. In the grid map, we transform an input map to a tile arrangement. However, current approaches do not perform well on complex maps such as the Netherlands. We propose a pipeline that generates high quality and coherent grid maps even for complex data using a simple pipeline. This paper explores the efficacy of using narratives as a medium of explaining the causality in causal networks. Now, towards this end, we provide you a glimpse of CauseWorks, a causality visualization system for generating narratives given a set of interventions and objectives for a causal model. And we further validate CauseWorks through interviews with experts. Please read our paper to know more. Thank you. We propose a method palette tailor that fully automates the coloring process of categorical data and produces discriminable results. Based on both color and data spaces, our method incorporates three scoring functions into a customized or simulated annealing algorithm. We apply our method to different types of visualizations and compare it with the state-of-the-art palettes through a controlled user study. Hi, everyone. It is a work about graph visualization. With one node link diagram, dragging node can change the layout of the diagram as you like. But how about more diagrams? Dragging nodes can be laborious. Please come to our talk about exemplar based layout fine tuning for node link diagrams. We will give you our ideas. Hi, everyone. It is a work about graph visualization. With one node link diagram, dragging node can change the layout of the diagram as you like. But how about more diagrams? Dragging nodes can be laborious. Please come to our talk about exemplar-based layout fine-tuning for node link diagrams. We will give you our ideas. This study presents a method to explore hierarchical data by improving RodViz, one of the visualization techniques for multidimensional data. The user can set options for nodes and check the data in groups or individually in the RodViz. Three subviews at the right enable the hierarchical clustering structures of selected data and allow the user to grasp the features of selected data.
As a result, this system allows more detailed insight into the data while solving the node overlapping problem. The blood vessel structure on the human placenta can be an important indicator in the detection of birth complications, but the segmentation of the vasculature tree remains a challenging problem. In our work, we show how MRI visualizations in immersive virtual reality can help medical practitioners to identify blood vessels without the need for a contrast agent. We present the results of a user study and lessons we learned for vasculature exploration in VR. Chiroplast maps are popular, however, we have better encodings for numeric values. Check out the PRISM map. Worry about occlusion and perspective distortion? Let's go immersive. Want to have both of them? We present Tilt Map, a novel interaction technique for transitioning from a Chiroplast map to a PRISM map to a bar chart to overcome the limitations of each. Believe me, Tilt Map opens up many research possibilities. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Share your analysis securely. Your entire organization can access these interactive dashboards from any browser or mobile device to find their own answers. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. To uncover football tactics, we create spaces and times. We use time query, construct spaces, construct times. Our approach was used for reconstructing team tactics in different classes of game situations. Our domain experts are happy and the Germans shall win again and again. Metrosets is an online platform for visualizing sets as metro maps. In this style of drawing, sets are represented with metro lines, while the elements they contain are represented as stations. Metrosets is implemented using a modular four-step pipeline, with a variety of choices for each step. The final visualization is interactive, with support for all common set operations. Metrosets is fully implemented and can be found at the displayed URL. The recent technological advancements in mixed reality extend our ability to evaluate new visualizations faster than ever before. In a user study with 60 participants, we compared four situated visualizations using five different empirical methods. In contrast to prior work, our results showed no dependency between the user's feedback and the empirical methods.
Atmospheric convection is one of the most important phenomena in metrology. It is responsible for cloud formation and storms. Yet, the measurements of the convective processes are expensive and scarce. In Isotrotter, we collaborate with a domain expert to build an empirical model of the atmospheric convection based on paragliding data. We design a novel visual parameter space analysis technique using isostructures in the parameter space to explain and validate the model. Capturing analytic provenance is important for refining sense-making analysis. However, understanding this provenance can be difficult in distributed collaborations. We present a novel concept, crowd auditing, as a way to help debug distributed sense-making. We implemented the concept in a system called CrowdTrace that visualizes and traces the analysis provenance and elicit feedback to improve the analysis. We present responsive matrix cells, a focus on context approach for exploring and editing multivariate graphs. For a matrix visualization encoding both adjacency and node similarity, we propose to embed responsive visualizations in these cells. These visualizations can not only detail the aggregated value of a single cell, but also represent multivariate or structural aspects for a group of cells and even allow for editing values. Urban motion, illustrating the movement of population from billions of sparse trajectory records. Chang'an Avenue correlates with movement flow, the regions with the largest flow volume. Zoom into the region. The southern Huilongguan region is mostly in blue, cut by G6, which could account for its commuting issue. Rainstorm in Beijing, movement speed is much higher on average. At the remote regions of Beijing, there are few local movements. As word clouds grow bigger and words get pushed into the periphery, viewers are less able to accurately compare data, font size for example, associated with each word. This indicates that large distances between words detract from a reader's ability to extract data from the word cloud, but that this bias goes away with the longer periods of reader perusal, suggesting perusal time being an important consideration for design. Typically, black hole visualization takes a lot of compute time, but we achieve a quite faithful reproduction at interactive rates on a standard computer. For this, we make use of a novel adaptive grid approach to focus calculations where needed. Coupled with filtering and interpolation methods, we can obtain high quality imagery. Our approach accepts star catalogs and environment maps and generates the resulting deformations in real time. This work presents a detailed account of an attempt to explain tightly coupled relationships through storytelling and animation in a multi-user, informal learning environment to a public with varying prior knowledge on the domain and identifies lessons for future design. It offers qualitative empirical findings with particular emphasis on how despite careful design, visitors may walk away with little knowledge about the data and the problem. When building the hierarchy for big data, different users may require different hierarchies to meet their diverse needs. However, existing one-size-fits-all methods often fail to meet the diverse needs. To tackle this issue, we present an interactive steering method to visually supervise the constrained hierarchical clustering by utilizing both public knowledge from knowledge base and private knowledge from users. Generating a stacking ensemble of models is usually a complicated trial and error process. In order to deliver the best and most diverse stacks to the user, we propose Stacks and Viz, a visual analytic system that supports an iterative process. With different algorithms and quality metrics, instance and feature selection, model optimization, and more. Over hundreds of tools exist for visualizing genomics data, leaving the analysts with a large design space to analyze before finalizing the visualization. We present a data and task-based recommendation system. The recommendation system uses a sequential model to suggest appropriate visualizations to users. To learn more about our recommendation methodology and results, please visit our poster. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. 
It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. University directories routinely become outdated and often lack the information necessary for understanding a researcher's interests and past work. To assist in the exploration of research talent, we have designed PeopleMap, an interactive tool that maps out researchers using NLP techniques. By using PeopleMap, users can explore the diversity of research at an institution and identify potential research talents. We present Uplift, a system that supports casual collaborative visual analytics in the domain of smart grid technologies. We applied a co-design approach to design, implement, and evaluate Uplift with experts in energy systems and members of the Monash Microgrid project. Uplift uses embedded data visualization to show energy data for each campus building. Hi, please come see our talk if you are curious about how to encode your data so that it can be efficiently queried later at different fidelity levels by fetching only the relevant bits from the disk. The talk is titled Efficient and Flexible Hierarchical Data Layouts for a Unified...